in an old-fashioned gray silk suit and silk is quite expensive so mm -hmm. he's a man who had a little bit more financial clout and he's got a suit he's a bigger man he's not small mm -hmm. um, I would say he's at least six foot he might even be bigger than that but there's a more of a sense of massiveness not overweight but just more mass to him mm -hmm. he's, he's not slim like she's very slight he has a mass to him um, he's got darker hair, he's got a bit of a mustache on, mm. and he just seems to be, um, he, he has some sort of eyeglasses, and I'm not sure if they're for reading or if they're for driving, but it's like he puts them up onto his head like you're wearing yours, mm -hmm. as if he doesn't need them all the time, mm. so he sets them up and then he pulls them back down, and maybe that he needs them for detail work. He's definitely a businessman. He might have been an attorney or in some sort of capacity where he worked in offices of some sort. Mm -hmm. and he seems to be a person who had quite a bit of responsibility and, and uh, took a lot of pride. He's an educated man, has a college degree, and um, he seems to uh, smoke. Um, they're little brown... Um, kind of like, I guess, little brown cigarettes. They're small and compact. I don't know what they are. I haven't <laughs> seen these before. They look like brown cigarettes. Huh. So maybe they were fatty or maybe they're little... Little cigars or little something? Tight. I don't know. They're mm -hmm. just, they're, they're shaped like a cigarette, but they're brown. Mm. So, yeah, maybe they are little cigars. Or maybe About five years ago, I had just gone through a massively intrusive, priority-shifting, life-changing medical diagnosis. Two years of this process. When I was finally on the other side of it, on the mend, our dog, Torque, suddenly passed away. And finally, we were about to leave our Hollywood life of 10 years for the South. Worlds away. Big, jarring change that I wasn't entirely emotionally prepared for. And I was scared and depressed about that. What a way to begin an episode. I know, I certainly know how to set a stage. It's not always a terrible, world-shattering scenario that will land you in front of a medium, but in this case it was. I'd never been to a medium before. I'd seen a lot on TV, so thought I had a general gist of how it would go. Didn't know what I thought about them, didn't know if I believed any of that crap. But it was a gift from my sister, who knew just how dark Lee's and my world had become. And it was an incredible gift, as I would come to find out. I actually thought I had lost this recording, and then just in time for this episode, I found it, dudes, buried in my phone. And I am so glad, because I listened to this reading again last night, and I thought I had remembered most of the things she had told me, but five years ago was a long time, and we all know the tricks our memory likes to play. I had forgotten most of it. And what was interesting listening through, I must have been more on the skeptical side going into this reading because I can hear in my responses a lot of, yeah, maybe, sure, no, I don't think that's it, you know, like non-participatory responses. I do start to warm up to her and the process about halfway through, but I feel the need to apologize for five years ago, Kristen, because even though I couldn't make some of the connections at the time, listening back on it, I can make a lot more of those connections that she made. Also, at this time, I was just getting introduced to an entire side of my family and its history that I hadn't been aware of before. So some of the people that she was bringing through didn't quite make sense to me at the time. But she was able to bring through a friend that Lee and I had lost, and she described him perfectly. He had this reddish blonde hair. Well, in the reading, she said he had reddish hair. Not a lot of people do. Lucky guess? She said the way he made her feel was like he liked to create things artistically. Well, he was an actor. She said he was almost jovial, childlike in his approach to life. Big smile on his face as if listening to a joke. Said he was a humorous fellow. 
These descriptions may seem like general guesses on the surface, but when you really think about it, they are quite specific when put together like this. They paint the picture of a particular person. I'm not jovial. I rarely have a big stupid smile on my face. I'm not childlike. So if I had been the deceased person and she were describing me in this way, that of course would be wrong. Wouldn't you agree? So she got a lot of hits, as they say, about my friend. She also brought through two family members, one from my mother's side, who I was aware of, and one from my father's side, who you just heard at the top of the show. I had no idea who she was talking about with him, but instead of fuzzing up details about this person when I said I didn't know them, she just kept hammering on the same exact physical and mental attributes that she was seeing. I might yet be able to piece that one together someday because it was so specific. Now, all mediums are psychic as well, as we've discussed. They may have a myriad of other gifts. This medium in particular could read auras. She saw a lot of green in a shade that she said meant to her that I had healed from something major. I had. She also said she didn't usually see the lack of a defined line at the outer edge, which meant to her that I needed to be better about reeling in my energy and setting my boundaries rather than letting people walk all over me. Also true at the time. Her tool of choice was tarot. She used this to answer questions I had about my career and future. One thing she said specifically about the trajectory of my career really perked my ears up listening through it again last night. I can look back on five years ago, Kristen, and know that I didn't really know what she was talking about. But now I know exactly what she was saying. I will play that clip at the end of the episode. If you have listened to this show for any length of time, I think you'll agree with what she had to say. And at the end of the reading, with minutes to spare, she brought Torque through for me. It was healing and comforting to hear from him. She described his personality, knew he was big, said he was always hanging around the garbage can and uh, was still doing it in the afterlife. And that was funny because he was always hanging around the garbage can waiting for some scraps before we would toss them. What really got me, though was that he wanted to come be with us again, but this next time he was coming back as something smaller so that I would let him on the couch. Why did that get to me? Why did that resonate with me? Because it was a years-long battle to keep Torque off the damn couch. I knew that's where he wanted to be. I knew he just wanted to sit somewhere comfortable, close to Lee and I, and I felt a massive amount of guilt after he passed for having fought him so hard on it. Now, if he has returned already, as she said he would, he obviously didn't come back as one of my dogs. They are both large dogs. We don't have a couch now after the move, but I still happily let either of them up on the bed with me. But one of my cats in particular, I have always suspected could be him, I've been told numerous times by sensitives and the like that a trans species reincarnation type situation just doesn't happen. It is my gut instinct that if reincarnation happens at all, those people are wrong. Because there is no hierarchy when we're talking about limitless possibilities and spirit and energy. It is all the same. So I've had a special bond with this creature since the day I saw him at the shelter. It was like I knew him. He's got a lot of the same personality traits, a lot of the same mannerisms that Torque did. First thing he did after he finally came out of hiding from under the bed was fall asleep on one of Lee's shirts in the middle of the room. It's a strange place for a cat to sleep out in the open like that overnight. And then this sucker has turned into a big old fatty. One might say he's got a similar physique as his predecessor but no matter how big he gets. I'll never hesitate to let him up onto my lap while I'm watching TV, because I know that's exactly where he wants to be. Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. 
You know, for whatever reason, when I sat down to outline this episode, I kept thinking like, okay, I should go with like a skeptical take on this. There's more than enough material to do it, right? The medium world is rife with people who either don't know what they're doing and are doing more harm than good, or there are more than enough people who know that they aren't the real deal, just collecting money for false information and preying on folks' false hope. Ooh, I saw your profile and I sensed you needed a reading, right? We're all familiar. But I couldn't stop thinking about this reading that I personally had. And it was so good, so filled with hope, so filled with validated information. I had a good experience with a personal reading. I felt good about that reading. I have had psychic mediums on my show. And let me just say this. It is so easy to call BS on a psychic medium when you're screaming from a distance. It's so easy. I get it because it seems impossible. But even if you don't have a personal reading with them, even if you just talk to them, as I did, when you get to hear them speak, when the mic is off and no one's listening, you guys, I won't name names, but the guests that I have personally had on this show and got to have that experience with, they are the real deal. They are, in my opinion. (laughs) And they mean well, and they only want to help. People like to tell me things. They've always done it. That's one of my secret weapons. I don't know why. I'll just leave it at that. Um, You know, it's also so easy to call BS on the entire topic of mediumship. If you aren't familiar with the countless number of near-death experience stories, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, uh, the process of astral projection, hello, that splitting of consciousness from the physical, or the incredible work and vetting done at the Family Forever Foundation, the Society for Psychical Research, the Rhine Institute, or independent investigators like Dr. Gary Schwartz, or parapsychologists like Lloyd Arbach. So, back to the show. What I decided to do, based on my good experiences with mediums and from the supporting information I have gathered over the years in accounts and scientific research and studies on both mediumship and the afterlife, I decided to go with a more supportive angle with this today because I believe this ability to be real. There's my first real opinion this season. I can't not believe that at least the ability is real. That is, the ability to communicate with the spirit world. Whether certain people are genuine, that is a discussion for another day. But the gift of mediumship itself, I am down with it. Not everyone listening agrees with that. I know it is all right. Let's just take a closer look. Let me introduce you to mediumship and mediums, the rock stars of the psychic world. I'm going to be a paid medium, too. And I will be the most honest, basic, say-what-I-see medium I can be. I want to make this more normal for people with no fancy crap that normal people would be scared off by. This industry is its own downfall, and it's a shame it is so full of shit, leaving skeptics to remain skeptic, missing some very special things that could happen in their lives just because the theatrical crap has scared them off. That is a quote from the book Awakenings, Mediumship, Third Eyes, and Mental Health by Sean Graham, a.k.a. the No BS Psychic. This author spends a good deal of time in this book detailing out in a very raw way his own awakening and acceptance of something strange that was happening to him, an ability to sense the presence of spirits, images and sound and knowledge coming to him from the ether that continually was being validated by others to be true. He grappled a lot with the rules and fears and, at times, theatrical cult-like mentality that pervades certain spiritual, psychic, and medium circles and groups. He approached and continues to approach his own abilities with a healthy amount of skepticism, actually. I think maybe that's why I love this read so much. But he says, there came a point where there was far too much evidence being provided to him and later being confirmed as fact by the living that he ultimately had to accept that this ability was real, that that he had to believe it was real within himself. 
And that, yes, while there were flaws with the woo-woo-centric system that was already in place when he had his awakening and almost scared him off for good, he realized there was no one right way to do any of this. That he was allowed to question it, to turn things over and form his own beliefs and process. He realized he didn't have to accept everything he was being told and taught early on as fact and would instead only accept what he could actually prove. That's what he needed for himself to accept that he was a psychic medium. And this speaks to a point I'm going to make today that there are no two mediums who are alike in their process, in their interpretation abilities, in their journey. And there really is no one right way to do mediumship, despite what we may have already learned about this world and think we understand. And of course, the stereotypes that we're all already aware of, it is all quite individualistic and unique to the practitioner themselves. Sean Graham also talks about the individual's unique interpretation of symbols and information using the metaphor of a toolbox. He's come to realize that you're only going to have access to signs, symbols, images that your mind is already a hold of. So it might behoove you as a medium to become a great student of all things so that you may add new information that could then be used by spirit when communicating. The idea of an individualistic interpretation of symbols and signs by any given medium was also noted in a 2010 essay by Carlos S. Alvarado titled Investigating Mental Mediums, Research Suggestions from the Historical Literature. Carlos writes, according to Hereward Carrington, 1920, it is in the interpretation of these symbols that much of the true art of mediumship and psychic development will be found to lie. He adds, each medium must learn by repeated experience what the various symbols mean and thus form a code or method of interpretation. Consistent with this and based on their analysis of the experiences of many mediums, Emmons and Emmons 2003 stated that, to a great extent, mediums have separate psychic dictionaries. I think it's fair to say that some symbols and images that would come through might be of a more universal flavor. Like if you're presented with the image of a wedding dress, there are fairly specific things you would interpret from that. Whereas if you're presented with like a bouquet of red roses, well, does that mean marriage, funeral, first dates, uh, love and relationship? Maybe it's referring to someone named Rose. Maybe you're a florist. It just comes down to becoming familiar with the regular signs and symbols that come through and understanding for oneself what it means personally. It's the mediums and the mediums alone toolbox. Sean is what would be considered an evidential mental psychic medium. And evidential is what it sounds like. Any sort of evidential medium will not ask you, the sitter, for any details that could relay any information about the deceased person prior to bringing them through to communicate. They might, however, like to hear confirmation after the fact to know that they're on the right track. Perhaps that decision to provide it is best left up to you. The evidential medium is simply going to continue to say what they see, hopefully bringing through evidence that they are in fact speaking to your deceased loved one word to the wise. If you book a reading from an evidential medium and they do ask beforehand for names, birth dates, gender information for either yourself or the person you wish to contact, red flag buds run the other way quickly. There are different types of mediums and you're going to come across a lot of them who claim to be of an evidential sort when they are in fact er, a bit more general than that. It's fine to get your reading from a different sort if you like. I personally would prefer to sit with an evidential type rather than someone speaking to my, you know, spirit guide who I've never met or like an angel or deity that I have no actual proof from my own life to back it up. Personal confirmation of details and facts makes the cockles of my shriveled up little skeptical heart sing. There are traditionally two categories of mediumship that all of the different types will fall under and evidential can fall under both, but we've got the mental and the physical medium. And I am sorry, I have to yet again make a correction to some of the information I have relayed. Previously, I included the trance medium under the umbrella of physical mediumship. 
While it seems like that makes a lot of sense as the spirit can seem to embody the medium, trance mediumship is actually considered to be a mental sort as the spirit is using the reader's mind to communicate more so than their actual body. Like nobody's getting possessed by a spirit here. In fact, the medium is supposedly fully conscious during these events. They can get up, walk around, interact, react. They have full awareness of these spirit thoughts coming through them. It is just a matter of them setting their ego aside enough to allow for another's to come through via their mind and relayed via their voice. Like I said previously, most of the mediums you are familiar with today is going to be the mental medium. Though there are still physical mediums practicing today, since the heyday of the spiritualism movement and their public displays of physical mediumship, this has been the way that this world has trended. And it's no surprise, as so many involved in that movement were thankfully and publicly debunked and shamed, because they were indeed frauds and con artists. I have zero sympathy for people like the Fox sisters, the Davenport brothers, Mina Crandon, or Madame de Esperance. Whether or not these people at any time in their lives had actually experienced these abilities, they lost the plot and gave in to greed. They were nothing more than performance artists preying on the public's need for hope and solace after the Civil War. And they were easily outed, because you can only regurgitate old magazine pages calling it ectoplasm before someone recognizes a celebrity's face in there. It all seems so stupid to us now, doesn't it? But a lot of people were duped by these performances. A lot of people lost everything they had to it. I am just now getting into some of the information on the Fox sisters, and I'm understanding that there may have been some pressure on them to falsely claim that they were fraudulent all along, Don't know enough about it yet, but we will dig a little deeper into their story at a later date. For now, even if the spiritualism movement makes us skeptical of the physical medium, it would seem that the mental medium of the current day is doing something kind of special. And when the cynical outcry of cold reading, hot reading, suggestibility of the sitter, or reading of the sitter's body language dies down and there is still something inexplicable happening, it gives one pause. What is going on here? How are they doing it? Before we get into the ability itself, I did also want to include something else that has been suggested as to what is occurring when this phenomenon is taking place. From the same essay I just referenced before, Myers. 1884, argued early on for the interpretation of some mediumship on the basis of subconscious creations by the living mind of the medium and sometimes transcending intrapsychic processes through recourse to telepathy. Edward von Hartmann, 1885, wrote about a somnambulistic consciousness in mediums that inclines to symbolizing and personification showing a dramatic metamorphosizing talent to produce fictitious communications. He postulated that such consciousness could obtain information from the waking consciousness and memories of the medium, as well as through telepathy and clairvoyance. That's a lot of mumbly-jumbly old talk, but what they are saying here is that mediums could very well be creating these communications from their own creative subconscious mind, sure. Or (laughs) a very thought I have had myself, and while it does not negate that something both special and supernatural is taking place, it does take a bit of the magic out of it. Some have theorized that the medium is performing telepathy or clairvoyance on their sitter, but not relaying information from an unseen spirit. It's an interesting thought to keep in mind. It would mean, though, that even the medium themselves wouldn't know that they weren't actually speaking to the dead. The reason I've come to think it's more than that is that there are times that the information coming through cannot be verified by the sitter until a much later date, because it was information that was simply unknown to them on any level and had to be obtained by someone else entirely. But still an interesting theory, and who knows, it may be appropriate in some cases. 
All right. We are going to get into physical mediumship in the episode on uh, ectoplasm. For now, I wanted to explore or introduce a couple of modern day mediums. You might be familiar with them already. Um, And then we shall talk about how one might know that they have some mediumistic abilities within themselves. Because this wouldn't be Paranorm Girl if I didn't convince you that you too could be psychic, empathic, a medium, what have you. Psychic medium Matt Frazier is a fun one. He starred in the reality show chronicling his family and psychic life called Meet the Frasers and is all over the internet in various television interviews and appearances. He says that he started hearing and seeing The Departed when he was three or four years old, and he remembers being absolutely petrified. The more he tried to ignore it, the stronger it seemed to get, like being in a movie that he couldn't get out of. And he recalls just wanting to be normal, not wanting to see or hear anything. He just wanted to be a normal kid his age. His own advice to anyone going into a reading with a medium is to go in as a skeptic. He encourages it. And it is because he knows that not everyone who calls themselves a medium is one. And those who are, really are. And you've got to go in with just a little more caution and suss out the situation. I think that's awesome to hear coming from a medium. Much like what we talked about before in the individual reader's interpretation and communication style, he says that the way he receives information is sometimes like being handed a photo album and then having to look through those images and connect the dots. His example was, okay, so this looks like a grandfather, so we're talking about your grandfather or a grandfatherly figure, or this looks like you're at a birthday party, etc., etc. Tyler Henry. I really like this kid. I've personally seen him numerous times on TV, and I've watched his show Life After Death. He always comes across as sincere and genuine and emotionally attuned to whatever information he's divulging. I know there must be huge misses in his work that maybe just aren't being portrayed on the shows he does, of course, because there's just no such thing as a medium who's 100% accurate 100% of the time. That being said, in what we can see of Tyler's work, it's incredible. Reality TV aside, if what is being shown on screen is even 80% close to what is actually happening as they shoot... The stuff he knows and tells his sitters is truly astounding. Like, I have had goosebumps watching some of his sessions. So Tyler's journey began when he was 10, when he began to receive intuitive mental images that would end up foretelling the passing of his grandmother. He went on to cultivate this ability with friends and classmates, but word got around his hometown. As he was taking college classes to go into hospice care, he was still providing private readings at a local bookstore. Word spread even wider to Los Angeles, and well-known celebrities started booking appointments with him. Of course, if you are aware of him already, you know he would continue on to become known as the Hollywood medium. What I find really intriguing about Tyler is if I didn't already know what he did for a living, I would have never placed it because he is not what you would call a flamboyantly outgoing character which is in stark contrast to such TV personalities as Teresa Caputo and Matt Frazier. He's a really reserved, dare I say, shy dude. Speaking of Teresa Caputo, let's do one more. The Long Island medium has been seeing, feeling, and sensing spirits since she was four. She says on her website that it wasn't until her 20s, though, that she learned how to communicate with them. She would visit a spiritual healer after spending years with a therapist because of severe anxiety and would be told by that healer that she was suppressing spirit's energy, which was causing her anxiety. Once she learned how to channel and release the energy, she began to heal. When asked how she is receiving the information, she says it's through her sixth sense of feeling and knowing, that it often feels like a very strong intuition or recall. She also talks about... Again, what we just talked about, how over the years she has come to know what different signs and symbols mean to her and has come to assign her own meaning and interpretation to them when they come through. So it's like her very own language with the other side. She does want people to know 
that after her translation and deliverance of a message, it is up to the client to interpret how the meaning is significant. Seems fair, but mm, I see how that absolutely feeds the skeptic's mind. Personally, I haven't watched her enough on TV to feel one way or another about her. There was something just always too distracting about her. Can't quite put my hair on it, though. Okay, let's talk the ability itself and the signs you might want to pay attention to as they pertain to your own abilities. Clairvoyant medium Anne Sharman says that most people find that mediumship is something that tends to come to them naturally. So she's not saying it's something you must be born with. A lot of mediums, even well-known ones, don't come into their abilities until much later in life. So you can be born with it, like any other natural gift, or you might specifically be drawn to it. If you do find that you are being drawn to it, Anne recommends not going it alone. It can be a pretty rough journey to fully awakening this potential. She says it would be best to find a person, group, or course that can help you learn how to work with others' energies, how best to communicate with those on the other side, and how best to convey the messages that you receive. She also highly recommends meditation, saying it is fundamental to the medium. I watched a really great video by medium Jason Goldsworthy over on YouTube. I'll link it below. Out of all of the lists and chapters on signs you could keep an eye out for, I thought his explanation was pretty all-encompassing and easy to understand. Here is what Mr. Goldsworthy says the signs are a person might get that would clue them into their own mediumistic abilities. And keep in mind, according to him, if you have or are experiencing three or more of these, you likely are highly gifted already, even if that's news to you. Here goes. You've got a highly empathic nature and are very sensitive. This can be with people you meet and places you go. You pick up on and feel things on an energetic and emotional level, and these subtle spikes, shifts, impulses, gut reactions, whatever you want to call them, don't just take place for things happening in the moment. They can be about things that have happened in the past as well. You hear your name being called. This is a very common sign. It happens when you're alone, when no one else called your name. A lot of people report hearing it upon first waking. This is a sign that spirit is trying to communicate with you via clairaudience. You often feel like someone is watching you when there's no one there. Often, people report feeling like someone is standing right behind them. Jason feels this happens more in the beginning of a medium's journey as you're just starting to open up that sensitivity and connection with the spirit world. So you're just starting to sense what's really been there all along. You might actually feel an unseen force touching you physically via your clairsentience. They touch your shoulder, they tug your hair, they grab your hand. You see spirit either as a silhouette or a shadow and out of the corner of your eye. When you turn to look, there's nobody there. You might also have the experience of seeing someone or something fully there, but when you turn to look away and then look back, boom, they're gone. This same sign can also happen within your mind's inner eye, which might be a little harder for you to decipher for yourself, and you may just chalk it up to your imagination. But, I mean, let's be honest, anyone hardcore opposed to any of this can chalk any of it up to imagination. Yes? Anyway... Jason says spirit is using visual cues to you in an attempt to try and wake you up. And upon your acceptance that you are in fact seeing these things, it may start to happen more frequently. So be aware. Another sign you're opening up as a medium is suddenly smelling phantom scents. We talked about this, but perfumes, cigarettes, flowers, cigar smoke, really any scent that you smell that does not have a logical cause could tip you off to an unseen someone with an emotional tie to that scent. You often experience flickering lights and electrical appliances turning on and off in your presence. This can work twofold. As any paranormal investigator will tell you, spirits can manipulate energy and their sources. But a developing medium is widening their energetic reach as well. You and your expanding energy field very well could be the cause of any electrical malfunctions in the area. Music. It's a very common sign, but one you would have to be aware of in order to interpret the deeper meaning or communication behind it. 
a special piece of music or song can come to you in your dreams, or you wake up with that song in your head, can't get it out of your mind, or you get in your car, the song is playing, you walk into work, the same song is playing, your coworker's phone rings, the ringtone is that song, time to pay attention. Some things to keep in mind would be if the song reminds you of a loved one, or how the tune itself is making you feel, or if there's a literal message for you in the lyrics. All of this could be a sign from spirit who is trying to communicate something to you. Try not to discount it next time this happens. And Jason says, there is always a message. Spirit can also reach out to you with a visitation via your dreams. These dreams are going to be of a more vivid variety. You might wake up and think, that really just happened. And if you continue to experience a knowing, you don't know how you know things, you just know. You're going to know the right direction to go, that you're making the right choice, that you're on the right path, that a new friend isn't who they say they are. Spirit is using claircognizance in this instance to nudge you along. So, again, if you have experienced three or more of these signs, it's very possible you are already very gifted with mediumistic abilities and may just not know it. It's up to you to develop them or experiment with it and be aware. The spirit world may give you even more of a nudge if this is something you actually should be pursuing. I was originally going to title this episode, How to Become a Medium in Three Easy Steps. I still think that's funny, but as I found, there's a little more to it than that. This is going to be a strange thing to include here at the end of the episode, but I have an announcement to make. This show may be taking a hiatus for a few weeks heading into September. I'm going to do my best to keep the episodes coming, but just wanted to make you aware that there may come a point when I'll take some time off from posting. But why, Kristen? I know, you're all devastated, but it's for a good reason. My sister's farm was short a truck driver this year for harvest, and they took one look at me and were like, you've got eyeballs to see, hands to steer, long enough legs to reach the pedals, you are our fill-in. And that is basically how that whole situation occurred. So I've been diligently training the last couple of weeks to drive this thing, trying to mentally prepare for this three-week-long, 12-hour day, no-day-off race to the finish line. Actor turned paranormal podcaster turned truck driver and wheat farmer. Life is weird, y'all. It's not a certainty about a break, but just wanted to give you the heads up that it's a good possibility. We'll let you know as we get closer, and yes, I will be posting pics of my truck driving adventures. Studies conducted at Paranorm Girl Podcast Laboratories have shown that rating and reviewing the show not only is good for my ego, but also adds years to the life of the show. So, doctor's orders, y'all. Rate and review. Follow the show on all socials at Paranorm Girl Pod. That's a wrap for now. Time for a final note. So as far as you saw the acting, like you, th you think that that's, that's going to always be a part or it's at least going to be in the near future? Yeah, I, I see you staying involved with it. I do feel like there may come a point where you decide to not be an actress as much as somebody who's either a producer or a, a doing something different, mm -hmm. but you'll, be, you'll stay in that arena or that okay. field. Um, I do feel like you might... I almost feel like you're doing background research or background um, gathering information for authenticity on something. Mm -hmm. So I, I do feel like there's going to be something coming up that um, in order to really play the part, you're going to have to do a lot of historical research okay. to cool. give it cool. credibility. And I think you're going to like that a lot and cool. maybe find yourself... Um, doing some sort of uh, investigative research to help with other people's parts and mm -hmm. stuff like that, um, okay. helping out. I feel like this new place that you find, you're not going to just be an actress, you're going you're gonna to be a part of the support staff as well. Mm -hmm. You might actually get some money from you know, doing certain actual activities and then acting as well. Mm -hmm. so. okay. 
this was the clip I was referring to at the top of the show. Of the entire reading, this part really stood out to me. At the time, I was on a break from my pursuit of an acting career, just trying to take some time after the medical stuff and the loss of my pup. But I'd I'd always assumed on some level that I'd get back to it at some point because I couldn't imagine going the rest of my life just not being a performer. I'd already committed almost like 20 years of my life to it. So as she was telling me this, I guess I just assumed she was talking about some future theater group or production company I was going to be a part of. Well, spoiler alert, I ended up not getting back to acting. I kept waiting for the bug to bite me again, but it was just never the same. So I stepped away from the idea of ever being an actor. Fast forward four years to early 2021, height of the pandemic. Mind you, I've long forgotten this part of the reading. I decide to start a podcast. This excited me for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, it was a chance for me to perform again. That desire to perform never went away in all that time. And this time, it would be on my own terms, at my own pace, and I wouldn't even have to sign a nudity clause. And reason number two, it was going to give me the opportunity to learn everything I possibly could about another topic I was passionate about, the paranormal. And then I could share everything I was learning about the paranormal with everyone else to help them out to better understand it. But what was it gonna take? A lot of research, historical research, background research for authenticity, for credibility, so that I could better play my part on this show, you might say. Research, dudes. Hosting my own podcast wasn't even a twinkle in my eyes five years ago. In a million years, never thought I'd be doing something like this. So while at the time we both assumed we were talking about some acting or production gig and in piecing it together in that way, it would have been an incorrect prediction. But if you understand, which we all should by this point, that she was just interpreting the information the best she could, while the setting was incorrect because of my own bias, her information was spot on. Wouldn't you agree? Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.